for state changes involving phases with molar volumes that can greatly vary, such as for gases, the Clapeyron equation cannot be used because we cannot assume the volume of the vapor is independent of pressure. So, starting with the Clapeyron equation, where we write out explicitly the change in molar volume of the transition, which gives dp by dt is equal to the change in enthalpy of the transition divided by the temperature times the molar volume of the gas minus the molar volume of the other phase, being solid or liquid. Since the molar volume of the gas is much larger than that of the other phase, we can neglect the molar volume of the other phase, which leaves dp by dt being equal to the change in enthalpy of the transition divided by the temperature times the molar volume of the gas. Assuming that the gas is ideal, we can substitute in the ideal gas law, where the molar volume is equal to the gas constant times the temperature divided by the pressure. The number of moles in this case is included in the molar volume term. This gives dp by dt is equal to the pressure times the change in enthalpy of the transition divided by the gas constant times the temperature squared. Rearranging so that all the pressure terms are on one side and all the temperature terms are on the other and integrating gives the integral from an initial pressure to a final pressure of dp over p and that's equal to the integral from an initial temperature to a final temperature of the change in enthalpy of the transition times dt over the gas constant times the temperature squared. Evaluating these integrals gives the natural logarithm of the final pressure over the initial pressure being equal to the change in enthalpy of the transition divided by the gas constant times the inverse of the initial temperature minus the inverse of the final temperature. This is the clausius clapeyron equation. This equation assumes that the molar volume of the gas is much larger than the molar volume of the other phase, that the vapor behaves ideally, and that the change in enthalpy of the transition is independent of the temperature and pressure for the region of interest. The vapor pressure of a substance is the pressure of a vapor in equilibrium with its condensed phase. It is demonstrated by the phase boundary meaning that the line that denotes the water vapor and solid vapor phase boundaries tells the vapor pressure of the substance for a given external pressure. So, when the vapor pressure matches the external pressure, the substance vaporizes. This is why, for instance, it takes longer to cook things at altitude, since the boiling point of water is lower. For example, the boiling point of water at sea level is 100 degrees Celsius, since the external pressure is about one atmosphere. At altitude, say in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, the external pressure drops. This means that we can only heat up water so much before the pressure matches the lower external pressure and therefore vaporizes. So let's use the clausius clapeyron equation then to predict what is the boiling point of water at altitude. So in this example we're using Pikes Peak in Colorado which is about 4300 meters above sea level. And there we see that the pressure at that point is 0.5836, that of the pressure at sea level. And so the question is asking us, what is the boiling point of water here? And they give us the change in enthalpy of vaporization for water is 40.79 kilojoules per mole. So starting with the clausius clapeyron equation, the natural logarithm of the final pressure over the initial pressure being equal to the change in enthalpy of the transition divided by the gas constant times the inverse of the initial temperature minus the inverse of the final temperature. And here if we take stock of what we have, the information that we're going to be using we can draw from a phase diagram for water, which I'll just draw quickly over here. So here we've got the solid phase, the liquid phase, and the gas phase. And in this case I should probably draw this phase boundary with a negative slope because we are dealing with water and it is an anomalous liquid. And so what we have here is we have typically at 100, Kelvin, 100 degrees Celsius or 373 Kelvin, this is where the typical boiling point of water is at one atmosphere, or essentially the pressure at sea level. And what we want to do is we want to go to a slightly lower pressure, which is 0 0.5836 times the pressure at sea level and we want to find out what is that temperature at that point. And so what we're going to use then is the information that we know of the boiling point of water at sea level. So we know that in this case the initial temperature we'll say is 373 Kelvin since that's the boiling point. We know the initial pressure is just the pressure at sea level. 
And the reason why I'm writing it like that is because I can write the final pressure as 0 0.5836 times the pressure at sea level. And so what we're in the end trying to find is what is this final temperature? Since we've identified all of this pertinent information, then really this is just an exercise of substituting in these variables into the clausius clapeyron equation and then solving for the final temperature. So if I do just that, I have the natural logarithm of the final pressure, 0 0.5836 times P, the pressure at sea level, divided by the initial pressure, which is just the pressure at sea level. That's going to be equal to 40.79 times 10 to the 3. And the reason why I'm writing it times 10 to the 3 is because I'm going to convert these kilojoules into joules. The reason why I do that is that my gas constant, 8.3145, is written in joules. And so I want to make sure that my units cancel out appropriately. I have my initial temperature, 1 over 373 minus 1 over T final, which is the variable that I'm trying to solve for. And since I've only got the one unknown, then I can solve for it. Right off the bat, I can cancel out my pressure at sea level. And so I'm just left with the natural logarithm of 0 0.5836. I'm going to have that multiplied by 8.3145 divided by 40.79 times 10 to the 3. And that's just because I multiplied both sides by the gas constant and also divided both sides by the enthalpy or the change in enthalpy of vaporization. That's going to be still equal to 1 over 373 minus 1 over T final. I will continue to rearrange. All I'm going to do is I'm going to take this negative 1 over T final. I'll move it to the other side. And I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to move it to the other side. And so by doing so, I'm going to get 1 over t final is equal to 1 over 373 minus the natural logarithm of 0 0.5836 times 8.3145 divided by 40.79 times 10 to the 3. At this point, I'll actually start substituting or starting to start solving for values. And I'm also going to write out the explicit inverse. Because in the end, I do have to take the inverse of this 1 over t final. And so all that means is that I'm going to have 1 over 373, which is 0 0.002681. I'm going to subtract from that. And the natural logarithm is 0 0.5836 times 8.3145 divided by 40.79 times 10 to the 3. That's going to be equal to negative 0 0.00011. And all of this is... Again, I'm taking the inverse of it because I'm trying to, I have to take the inverse of the left hand side. And so I take the inverse of both sides. And when I evaluate this, then I get a final temperature of 358 Kelvin. And as you can see, the prediction is exactly what we expected. At um, sea level, we have a temperature of 373 Kelvin, or roughly about 100 degrees Celsius. When we move up to higher, or sorry, to higher altitudes or lower pressures, then the temperature at which the, the water boils drops, which means it takes longer to cook things since we can't heat it up in water as high of a temperature as we normally could at sea level. The final thing we will cover in this lecture is the phase rule. It is defined as F is equal to C minus P plus 2, where C is the number of substances in the system, P is the number of phases present, and F is the number of variables being temperature, pressure, or composition that can be independently chosen without disturbing the number of phases in equilibrium. For example, if we have water vapor, then there is only one substance, H2O, so C is equal to 1. There is only one phase, being the vapor phase, so P is also equal to 1. Therefore, F is equal to 1 minus 1 plus 2, which gives 2. This means that we can select the temperature and pressure independently and still get water vapor. Looking specifically at a phase boundary, let's pretend that our water sample was at the liquid vapor phase boundary. C is still equal to 1 since there is still only H2O in the system. However, now there are two phases present, the liquid and the vapor phase, so P is equal to 2. This means that F is equal to 1 minus 2 plus 2, which gives 1. This means that once the temperature or the pressure is set, the other value must be a specific value in order for the system to be on the phase boundary. Here is a summary of this lecture. Free energies define if a process is spontaneous and does so by only using the thermodynamic properties of the system. 
a process is spontaneous if it is less than zero. The Helmholtz free energy A quantifies the total work possible by a process, while the Gibbs free energy G quantifies the total non-expansion work that is possible. In single component systems, we can use how the Gibbs free energy varies with respect to temperature and pressure to draw phase diagrams, and the Clapeyron equation can be used to define phase boundaries where the molar volume changes little, while the Clausius Clapeyron equation should be used when the molar volume changes dramatically across the phase boundary, like between a gas phase and either a liquid or solid phase.